Hey, audience out there. Hello. We're glad to be here again to talk to you. And today we want to talk about the concept of self and what do we know about the self? How do our ideas of self affect our experiences and our outcomes? And we're going to talk about how very old philosophical ideas can be affecting us today in the way we think about it. For example, how much of who you are is really under your control? How much of you is determined by the world around you? And what makes you you? What are your limits? We're going to face these questions head on and examine how the different narratives we have about who we are can really influence what we perceive as possible for ourselves. So stay with us as we delve into the concept of the self. You know, Liz, there, there's so many confusing ideas about self and what it is and how much control we have over who we are out, out there. Uh, what, what do you usually think of when you think of self? Well, when I think about myself or like the self, I think it's kind of equivalent to what people call your soul, although I don't really think about it in that kind of spiritual way. I think of it more like the essence of a person, like the essential characteristics that are almost indescribable, kind of like a je ne sais quoi about what makes this person unique. So it's kind of like all the little parts that make up who they are. So kind of like an integrated whole of, you know, your genetics and your parents and your upbringing and how you've lived and what's happened to you, what decisions you've made or your luck or your misfortune. So it's like this really complex thing of your life that together comes into this one self of who you are. So kind of like if you described all the characteristics of yourself, it gives someone an idea of who you were, but they wouldn't really know who you are or yourself because you're kind of composed of all of these different characteristics in one person. So it's really difficult to convey that to somebody. So the self is all these parts, but it's all the parts together. So I use this term, the soul, to relate to how I see the idea of the self because when you feel like someone really gets to see you for who you are and really knows the real you, it feels so special and it has this really distinct feeling that they really know who you are and I think that's why people attribute that spiritual feeling to it, like they see into my soul. But for me, the self is kind of like the essential characteristics that we kind of use the soul to encompass. Yeah, I get exactly what you mean, that there's this feeling. It's more than just knowing the different parts about somebody, but it's like this whole feeling about who they are that you get when you know their personality. Their personality is almost like um, a cloud, not a cloud in the negative sense, but a, a grouping of feelings about who they are and also what you know about them. So I really liked your description of self and the complexity of it. And I like the idea of the integrated whole that, you know, you know yourself as integrated whole, but I do think some people don't quite feel like that. They don't feel like all their parts are melded together and they try really hard to, to understand that. Yeah, I think that's kind of like when people are trying to figure out who they are in their life. I think maybe that's kind of what you're talking about. Like they know certain things about themselves, but they don't really get a sense of who they are or where they're going with their life. And I think this is kind of why personality tests are so popular. Like you see these on Facebook all the time, like which celebrity are you or which superhero, which character from friends are you? You know, what's your superpower if you had one? And I think people are just so drawn to these things and they love to learn about these qualities about who they are. I mean, even the Myers-Briggs personality profiles, people love to have an idea of who they are in this like one encapsulated thing. Like, oh, I'm an INTJ or I'm a this. You know, but in the end, what do these personality tests do for you? I mean, and how do you even know they're accurate? I don't really know what kind of understanding it gives to people, but... I think they get some kind of satisfaction or comfort out of it. 
Well, the, that's true. I mean, I think you're right that the, the test, it kind of comforts people because it allows them to classify themselves or know their patterns, you know, where they they don't seem so inexplicable to themselves before if they think that they, they have a pattern that's recognizable and that's true of a lot of other people, too. People have um, a very common experience if they have a difficulty and then they find out that, oh, they can classify it and that a lot of other people have it, that relaxes them. They, they feel a little better that it's not just some weird thing about themselves. They, they feel like, aha, I understand what I'm like now. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why the, the these little tests are useful. But like you said, how much do they really tell you about yourself and what to do about yourself, right? Well, I, I went and looked at a dictionary to see if, if that would help. And in the dictionary, self is defined as a person's essential being that distinguishes them from others, especially considered as the object of introspection or reflexive action. And that seems to be exactly what you were you said. So the thinking about what you're thinking, I noticed because they mentioned the introspection or the reflexive action, that thinking about what you're thinking or doing seems to be very important as the aspect of self. It seems like that in the in the dictionary. And there's another aspect to knowing self, I think, and, and that it's that we can't know ourselves directly as a personality like we know other people, but we can't experience ourselves as an integrated whole. We just know ourselves from the inside with our different thoughts and feelings and experiences. So this makes it really hard to know certain things about ourselves, and that's another reason people love feedback. It's one of the things we get out of love and friendship a reflection of self. And even Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics talked about it. He said a friend is another self. So what you said about someone seeing you for the real you, I think, is reflective of this experience. I like what you said about a friend is another self. And we like seeing a reflection of ourselves in our friends or even in these personality tests because it is difficult to know ourselves directly as a personality. So the big mystery is where does where does all this come from? You know, how does that self get created? And it seems like there's a lot of controversy about it too because some people claim that their selves, they can't locate their selves in their minds. And to me, that sounds like, well, as if they think that that their self was a little man in charge running you inside of yourself. What's what's in psychology is called a homunculus. Other ones argue that you don't have a self because you change all the time. So you're into music one decade and then you're into history the next and then science. So you're not really the same person. It's kind of like a Heracleitian objection that you can't step into the same self twice. You're not the same from minute to minute, from year to year, from decade to decade. So how is it really a self? And then there's a problem of if you make a promise now, you're requiring your future self to keep it, and you may be very different. So is that is that really the same self? Is there a continuity? And the, the Buddhists argue that if you work really hard in meditation, certain kinds of meditation, you can discover that you have no self. You can reach a point of awareness or consciousness where the self disappears. Their doctrine denies that there that there is anything called a self, in any person or anything else, and that that what we think of, what we believe is a self, is actually a source of suffering. So it's kind of like a, a mistaken idea that makes you suffer. So I'll come back to this later and these other issues that I'll bring up, but I want to talk about what everybody experiences as self. Some people, they believe that ourselves, in the sense of our particular being, or what you call the je ne sais quoi, is entirely determined by our biological selves, you know, what we're born with. And others, they think that it's formed by our social experiences, you know, as if we're an unformed blob of potentiality when we're born and that everything that we become is determined by what other people do and say to us and our interactions with the social environment, by the ideas and values that we take in and, and what happens to us. But it seems to me that both of those views have a certain kind of fatalism in them, you know, a belief or acceptance that we can't really control our lives. And 
I also think that this kind of fatalism is reflected in the stagnation of some people and some cultures because they just accept what the status quo is um, and they have no initiative about changing their lives. It seems like the idea of biological or social determinism, the, the two beliefs I just mentioned as our names for it is biological determinism or social determinism, they're a great explanation or a rationalization for not taking charge of one's life and for one's failures. You know, you can excuse yourself because of that. Yeah, I think I have some experience with that, actually. I like how you said that, you know, these beliefs, kind of like rationalization, can lead to a kind of fatalism or stagnation. And I think, like, I used to have this biological explanation of, why I was so depressed in my life. And we talked about this a little bit in our other episodes, but this is a different aspect of it. Um, Because I thought, you know, my dad has this sense of hopelessness that he's carried for like as long as I can remember. And I remember when I started to develop these feelings of sadness and depression, it must have been like through college and after college, I thought that I had just inherited this from my dad. Like I had this sad gene or this biological predisposition for depression and that my brain was developed in a way that I would just forever deal with this. Like I'd I'd always have this feeling of sadness or depression. And in a lot of ways, I do think it was just a big rationalization Um, or it felt more like a resignation, like a permission just to be that way because it's kind of inevitable. So why would I choose to struggle against this biological thing about me that's been determined? And so there's this inevitability to trying to do otherwise since it's just against my nature. But that's such a sad and bleak way of looking at your life. Um, I think another example of kind of the social determinism you talked about where you're influenced by your surroundings and ideas and people around you. It was I used to work with this man who had just become a father and he and his girlfriend had broken up before the baby was born. But I was talking to him about, oh, what's the nature of your relationship going to be like with a mother and your new role as a father? And he said something that really, really surprised me actually. Um, he said he didn't know if he'd be that involved in the child's life because He had a really bad relationship with his father, so it's probably inevitable that he'd be a bad father too. And, you know, in one aspect, I'm stuck in this biological determinism, and he's stuck in this social determinism. And in both examples, I think you see this fatalism and this resignation and this falling back on those aspects to rationalize not taking control of your life or your failures. Wow, it sure it sure sounds like that. What gets you out of that mindset? Um, well, I think beforehand, I just thought that was my identity. And it wasn't something that I could change at all. It's just like part of the deeper inner core of who I am. Like, you know, that integrated whole of who I was, that was a part of it. But I think what got me out of that mindset was thinking like, but what if that's not me? Like, what if the core of who I am is separate from this or deeper than this, you know, feeling? And thinking about it as like a challenge, like something that I was experiencing in my life, but that didn't constitute or define me, I think helped me get out of that mindset. And like I still think that maybe now it'll still be a struggle for me and something that I'll always return to, but I do think it's something I can overcome most of the time, and I think I have. And so first just thinking, like, maybe that isn't who I am, and then thinking about, like, well, what do I want to define me? Like, and I guess thinking in that sense was, like, I almost have a choice to decide what makes me me in some respects. So it gave me a place to start thinking about like, well, what do I want and who am I? And it's kind of a positive reinforcement or like a feedback loop because once 
I began to think like, well, maybe it's not me. What do I want to be me? Like you begin to feel better. Like you feel more effective. And that feeling of sadness or depression kind of goes away. And it's it was temporary. And so in that sense, since it went away, it was like, well, it, then that doesn't define me. Wow. That's really interesting and, and kind of amazing how you question yourself and you got yourself out of that whole loop. That's, that's an amazing achievement. Well, I think it fits what you mentioned earlier, that biologic and social determinist view. It's like a belief or an acceptance that we can't control our lives. So I told myself in the first part that like, oh, my biology determined me. And my coworker believed that like, oh, since he was raised this way, it's inevitable. He's just going to like follow that pattern. And I, I think it's so powerful because this thinking, it creates this kind of passivity towards life and this apathy. And then you're just like a bystander in your life. You don't take control of your life and you're, you don't rise to any challenge that arises in your life. And so for me, I kind of saw it as an expression of a fear of failure. For me, it was because like, what if I can't do it? What if I'm not good enough to do that? And it, I guess these may seem like pretty drastic examples, but I think there are so many common phrases that people actually use that indicate this kind of fatalistic thinking. Like when people just say, oh, it wasn't in the stars for me. Or it just wasn't meant to be for me to go to school or get this job or make a lot of money or to be happy. Or I'm ADD, so, you know, I just can't focus on this stuff and get things done. Like, I just can't accomplish those things. Or I just come from a family of short-tempered people, so I just have a short fuse. So, like, just deal with it. You know, it's like that kind of that stagnation that you talked about. Oh, oh, you're so right. I see this kind of talk all the time. And it seems like it's an outlook, well, like you said, that, that you're determined by your physical makeup, your genes, your inheritance, your physiology, your environment. You know, it's partly because these people have accepted a form of biological determinism, you know, that they that whatever they've inherited, they have no control over. Yeah, I think maybe an, another example of these are like, When people say, well, girls are just more emotionally sensitive than guys. Like, oh, that's just the guy brain. So it's kind of an excuse for the way guys behave. Or, you know, you're just, we're all just firing neurons and genes. So your limit is already determined by your biological makeup, like your IQ. So in that sense, it's like, why even try to, why even try further? Or... You know, you're Asian, so you must be good at math. It's like something I hear all the time, which is like not true. (laughs) But it's that idea that your biology determines you. And that's just a short list. Then there's the idea of social determinism all around us, that what we are is determined by society and your parents or whatever people tell you. Things like you're successful because you were born a wealthy white male, or you can't get ahead in life because racism is oppressing you, or... You women can't get ahead in engineering because of social conditioning. Yes, I've heard so many things like this. And it's like kind of a conflict between people saying, oh, it's your social environment. And then, no, it's your biology. Here people say like, oh, you're only submissive or shy or apologetic because you've been conditioned by the patriarchy or because Asian cultures want this in a woman or things like you must be like this because of what your parents did to you when you're a kid. But then you also hear things like, The reason why girls like pink things and play with baby dolls and boys play with trucks and tools is because it's been commercialized by society that way. So we're just influenced by society. But then other people say, well, that's just like a biological predisposition that girls like to take care of things. They're more nurturing than boys. So I feel like there's a conflict. Yeah, it's so confusing. But you know, there's something weird I've thought about this idea that we're all determined by our social environment, you know, by the beliefs and the values and the customs around us. If all of us were shaped and determined by our social environment, how did the first cultural norm get established? And they give vague answers like, well, it's from society or the patriarchy or the powerful as if those were some kind of force that was different from individual people, right? But if the individual people who came up with the ideas that 
are the most powerful in society, were shaped by society, where did their identities and norms originate? It's a kind of uh, infinite regress problem in that respect, you know? Yeah, I see the problem because if society is just a group of individual people, how were those people's identities shaped? It was like by the people before them and the people before them and the people before them. So there's no end. And I think it also doesn't really account for how we see change in societies over time. Like where does that change come from then? And just saying it comes from society doesn't really seem like a satisfactory answer. Yeah, and we know that when it comes to technology, we can pinpoint the inventors and creators of different ideas that have changed technology, right? So it should be the same, I would think, with social norms and social values. It's just that it seems like um, a lot vaguer how that got started. So that whole question of what creates the social environment is an interesting one. You know, where does that arise from? But I, I think that people use these things. We've talked about how people use these things to, to justify their behavior. But I also think that this need to justify your behavior comes from a, a unique aspect of human beings, and that's our need to think well of ourselves. So people's obsession with, oh, this characteristic of me is caused because my father was like it, or this characteristic is caused because of my social environment. I think that people are obsessed with that partly because they need to think well of themselves and they need to believe that they're okay, that they're good, and that they've done the best that they can. Commonly called, they need to have a good self-esteem or a good self-image. And the funny thing is, if you think about it, we don't ever see any evidence that dogs or cats or apes or dolphins are obsessed over their image in the mirror, right? If they even recognize it. Or that they seem to be worrying at all about themselves. But humans have this inner concern about how good they are and where they are in the social hierarchy. And they have that partly because humans can reflect on themselves. They can, they can think about themselves, right? And they can think about how good are, am I? And am I living up to my own standards? Am I drinking when I resolve not to? How good am I at, and you can fill in the blank, at uh, being a mother or at, at my job? Or how beautiful am I in comparison to other people? It's our ability to be self-aware or self-conscious in the sense of comparing yourself to standards or to the ideas of others or to our own standards. That's, it seems to me to be the source of a lot of anxieties and problems in people. And uh, it seems like it can cause people to be very inward looking in a paralyzing kind of way. You know, they become worried about whether they're measuring up and are they smart enough? Are they right in what they think and what they value? And all that seems to be related to the fact that we're highly social as human beings. So we're constantly comparing and competing with each other. But we also have the ability to reflect on it. So it's a kind of anxiety about are we living up to our own standards. And some people use the standards of others. Am I making enough money? Am I making as much money as my father did? Am I acting in the way my mother demanded? You know, you name it. But the funny thing is that a lot of times people aren't even aware of where their standard is from, no less even consider whether it's a right or wrong one, right? So that becomes a problem. They're, they're once again raising your awareness about where you got your ideas and values seems to be important to me. And the other thing about this issue of self-esteem or self-image is that it seems to be the cause of what many people call ego or arrogance. You know, people could get tangled up and very unhappy if they equate their self-esteem with how much money did they make or what degrees do they have or whether their marriage failed or not. Or are they, uh, I mean, in the United States where we seem to use the standard of how much money you made a lot. I think in other cultures that are more uh, traditional, it might be what is your status in the society? Are you an aristocrat or are you a peasant or something like that? I think that can affect your self-image. So like you mentioned, if you have an inherited problem that you can't control, then you don't have to blame yourself for it, right? You don't have to take on that failure. You didn't cause it. So in that way, if it's caused by an outside factor, 
then it doesn't have to affect your self-esteem. Yeah, I really like what you said about like the difference between humans and animals. Like one of them is that we are very self-conscious beings. We have an awareness of ourselves that separates us from animals in a big way. And I think this is maybe kind of related to what you talked about earlier about the Buddhist idea of the self as suffering. Because you mentioned that this is a source of a lot of anxiety for people, like their ego about comparing themselves to other people by these standards that maybe they don't even know that they have. I think that's really true, especially in my experience too. Like that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from. Am I doing this the right way? And I, I want to be good. I want to think well of myself. But I also like the way that you put it because it makes it sound more of a protective thing. Like these excuses, like, oh, I just inherited this problem. So I can't really control it. It's not just like, oh, you are, you know, rationalizing and you're you're accepting failure but it's kind of like your ego trying to protect itself and someone gave me this example of procrastination like if you always procrastinate then you don't ever produce your best work so if you get critiqued poorly for your work you can always tell yourself that you know maybe it's not really true that I make bad work because I didn't really do my best on this anyways since I procrastinated so in this sense, you're protecting your view of yourself because you you want to see yourself well and that you can like do good work and make good things. But then there's this other part that we kind of feel guilty about not doing our best and then we can berate ourselves and like ruminate on that. And then the trouble could also be that we may never create our best work because we become paralyzed by this. Well, what if I'm not good enough or what if I'm you know, not going to live up to this standard. So in that sense, it's also working against us. Absolutely. And on and on, people can go on and on with loops of problems that you can get into. You know, there was this psychologist, Nathaniel Brandon, who wrote about self-esteem way back in the 70s. And he defined it as the integrated sum of self-confidence and self-respect. And he described it respectively as a sense of personal efficacy and a sense of personal worth. So you'll notice that self-efficacy means being able to do things competently. And that's one of the keys to feeling good about yourself. But what's funny is that today, the idea of self-esteem itself has been distorted by people who don't understand it, I think. I recently heard psychologist Jordan Peterson railing against self-esteem as a narcissism, or meaning the way people sometimes hypnotize themselves and reassure themselves into thinking that they're good by just focusing on themselves without their goodness actually be con being connected to any actual accomplishment of virtue. You know, people who go around acting like they're all important and just paying attention to themselves are, are narcissistic. And that idea of self-esteem that, that you're good no matter what you do is kind of pushed on children nowadays with this idea of constantly giving them praise for even the smallest thing and trophies for everybody that seems to be pushing a kind of narcissistic idea of self-esteem, that it comes from just hypnotizing yourself into thinking that you're a good person. And it also seems to me to come from an idea that a fear of failure, that somehow if a child fails at all, it's going to devastate his psyche. But in fact, if you look at failure and the research on failure, failure is a normal thing. It's going to happen in life. So you have to learn how to cope with it and bounce back. You have to find new ways to achieve your purposes. That's real efficacy. If you can overcome failure, that really gives you a sense of accomplishment and competence. You know, if you can overcome failure and still achieve your, your goals. And you do that by pulling yourself together and you learn from the failure and you go one step at a time forward again. These are ways you strengthen yourself and, and you build up a real sense of self-esteem because of efficacy. So interestingly, I thought, though, after Peterson complained about the idea of, of self-esteem, he talked about how he is for people having a sense of efficacy and competence by doing things to improve life. And he thinks that's the way that you can achieve a sense of self-worth and of meaning. So the funny thing about it is that he's really on the same page as Brandon. It's all in the interpreters of self-esteem who got it screwed up and gave us this culture of infantilization, I think. So these are a few reasons 
the, the, this importance of self-esteem in the human mind, uh, in the sense of our own self-image, is one of the reasons that it's it's critical to have clear ideas about the self, because these ideas are fundamental to to functioning well. You know, you you experience yourself, and your self-image can hinder or it can help you. When someone bases their self-image on being the smartest guy in the room, or the richest, or the most handsome, it's very easy to have that self-image upended by the next guy who walks into the room who's smarter and handsomer and richer, right? So I think a narcissistic or a fragile conception of the self or the obsession with self-image is the idea of self that's largely behind this Buddhist concept of letting go of the self. As one site says, the Buddhist teaching of no self is about letting go. It's let go of our stories or in short, our egos. Our egos think those stories bring us security, but in reality, they act more like ill-fitting glasses that distort our vision. So that makes me think it's this narcissistic idea of self or this very hyper-aware sense of it. I think it's so true that these stories that we tell about ourselves, they do give us security, but they are really just like distortions. I mean, it's so amazing that these ideas of our self-image or, you know, what makes up our self are so powerful because our external reality can be the same and be unchanged but just the way we talk about ourselves or see ourselves can really they can totally change how we live and how we experience our reality even though that reality never changes so I think what Brandon mentioned in his definition of self-esteem is really key he said personal efficacy and I think this is exactly what the biologic and social determinist views of the self rob us of. And I think that's why it's so uncomfortable to think about these ideas as defining the self. Because in those views, we have no control over our lives. Our actions don't matter. We don't have a sense of efficacy. So it's kind of like the Buddhist teaching that maybe the ill-fitting glasses, maybe it's not exactly our egos themselves, but the narratives of the self that we default to unconsciously because we haven't really reflected and defined it for ourselves. And even though these views are prevalent, like we hear so many catchphrases about you're determined this way or by that way, I think most people still act as if they have some control over their fate. And I think we live like we do. Like I, I certainly do. So it seems like these ideas like, oh, you're just determined by your biology or society it's true to some respect but they're incomplete because it's not wholly who we are I mean and I think if we look at all the self-help or self-improvement books or like coaches and all the blogs about productivity hacks or how to improve your life I mean obviously they assume like we have some kind of degree of control and choice in how we direct our lives how else are we responsible for our life and our actions if we don't really have a choice I think there are plenty of examples of people who do improve their lives by choice and by like choosing to act differently. And we see that in people like biohackers or like elite athletes who just defy what we imagine is possible for the human body or entrepreneurs who like totally revolutionize an industry or even great writers or prisoner of war heroes. Like we definitely say they had a choice and like we admire and laud them because of their ability to overcome these huge social factors or these huge biological factors. For sure. I, you know, I was just reading the other day about uh, somebody I never knew about before, and that's a guy named Nicholas Winton, who apparently was an Englishman who was going to go skiing. And he ended up getting a call from a friend of his at the Czech embassy during in 1938, saying, you have to come right now. So he went there and it turned out that the friend was saying there's all these uh, Jews that were going to be something bad he knew was going to happen to them because of the Nazis. And they had to get, they, they were asking desperately to get, just get their children out of the country. So this Nicholas Winton ended up through all kinds of brilliant actions and courage, getting 669 children out of, out of uh, Czechoslovakia and saving them. So, you know, that's, that wasn't uh, by some kind of biological determinism, I don't think. 
And, and the funny thing is that even those acting under the influence of determinist views still make choices. When you think about it, we think people who really think they have no control, I mean, they just sit apathetically and they don't do anything and they don't make choices of any kind. We, we think that they're pathological, right? They're in a deep depression. So it's kind of funny that there's this idea that we don't have any kind of choice because we, on the other hand, think that people who are acting as if they don't have any choice are pathological. And the fact that people obsess over their self-esteem, well, that implies that they can do something about themselves and they're responsible for who they are. I think these theories of biological determinism and social determinism and Buddhist non-self, I think they miss a big factor. They miss the fact that we can direct our attention. We can choose what to think about. And this enables us to choose how we act. Uh, you know, you can force me to move my hand or you can confuse me. You can mislead me. You can influence me like they do in brainwashing or, you know, with restricting what I learn as I grow up or tweaking a motivational part of my brain when I'm in an experiment. But you can't force me to think something. You can't force me to think that two plus two equals five. And if this weren't true, why did the Inquisition or the KGB or anyone need to torture people to get them to agree to their ideas? They could just have done something physical to them to change their minds. So you see, the ability to choose what to pay attention to and therefore what to think, this is the locus of free will. This enables humans to change themselves and to change course to change the world. We have the power of abstract thought and we have the power to direct it. So what comes to mind for me when you say that is maybe an athlete running a marathon and their body's telling them that they're tired, they're fatigued, and don't want to go on, I can't do it. But when the athlete focuses on the finish line or accomplishing their goal and overcoming their body and their fatigue, that seems like an example of a person choosing what to think about and pay attention to and how that changes their actions, like they're able to push through that pain. Would that be a good way of thinking about it? Yeah, that's a perfect example. It shows how we can change our thinking and then be able to change our actions. You know, in fact, that's what this podcast is all about, becoming more aware of the power you have to change your thinking and to change the world. Here's another paradoxical problem with saying that you have no free will. If you deny free will exists, you're claiming to tell me a truth. But if you're an automaton, if you're entirely determined, you can't help saying that. So why should I believe you? Why are you, in fact, why are you arguing? And I'll bet you feel motivated to convince me. But what would that matter? You can't help what you're saying. You know, in a recent YouTube I watched of Daniel Dennett arguing about free will, he spends more than an hour trying to prove that there is no free will. Why bother? If I take him seriously, he can't help what he said, and, and I can't change what I think. It's all determined by our bodies and social environments, so how can arguments change minds? There is no mind. It's just brain, and it's all determined. But obviously, people spend hours and hours arguing about it and decades of research to prove that there is none. That's the perplexing question. Why do people act in everyday life as if they have choice, but theoretically, they stick to the idea that they don't? Why are so many people taken with these determinist ideas? They experience choice in everyday life constantly, yet so many insist that they're determined. I think the problem goes back to the assumption that determinism is the only scientific way to think about the world, that to be caused is to be determined, and that determined means to be entirely shaped by a previous set of actions not within your control. I think that they equate this because it ultimately comes from a mechanical worldview that most people have, that they equate, they equate the mechanical worldview with the scientific worldview. And this is that everything is merely a result of physics and chemistry and can be reduced to them, uh, that there are no other kind of factors or causes in why things happen. And this is a philosophical position and a presumption. And it leads people to assume that any other kind of explanation is not firmly rooted in science. It's an error or it's mystical if you try to make any other kind of argument about what causes things. 
So are you saying that under these deterministic views that if we're just a result of prior causes and events, there's no such thing as real choice as we know it. So our experience of choice is just an illusion? Exactly. That's exactly the position that they take. I see. Uh, it seems to me that it makes sense that past events explain much of who we are, right? there, That makes sense that we have reasons for the things we do and that things influence us. But it also doesn't seem really useful to think that it shapes all of who we are. Because we know that we are our bodies, and we are atoms and chemicals that obey physical laws, and we're a result of our upbringing culture to some degree. But I also know that we're different from an inanimate piece of rock, and we're not like this totally malleable thing that can totally be shaped by our environment. So it seems insufficient to describe our experience of agency and choice in the world and how we live. But I think there's an, even another problem with that, like you said, because if we're all determined to have different beliefs, then there's no such thing as truth because you're determined to have one view and I'm determined to have another. And since we're just a product of prior causes, our views are both equally valid because they're not really up to us. So like you said, like, then what's the point of arguing? Like, why do we even try to convince each other of things? And we've kind of talked about this in our previous episodes too, that if we have these two equally valid points, this doesn't really seem to be true and it's not really useful in any practical sense of living if there's no objective truth. There's just what you think and I think and it's perfectly valid. Yeah, exactly. You know, and because of this premise, it doesn't matter that we have all this evidence in everyday life overwhelmingly in favor of free will. You know, in the sense that we feel that we can direct our consciousness. There's tremendous introspective evidence about that related to the, the actions that we take. I know I can decide to look over here to check whether there's anything to worry about and then I could change, I can run away if there's a monster behind me. Or I look at a plate of food and I look at the meat and then I look at the vegetables and I think to myself, hmm, I think I should eat my vegetables first and I do that. So we have evidence in everyday life all the time that we have this ability to choose, but it's not considered valid evidence, the introspective experience of it. It's considered, oh, it's just an illusion. And I noticed that Dennett brings this up early in his arguments when he says, free will is exempt from the laws of physics, and the brain has decided. He, In other words, he talks completely in terms of the physical matter. These people constantly are talking about the brain and not the mind, you'll, you'll notice. If the obvious fact is that we have free will in our experience, I have to question the premise of determinism. I have to ask, is there another way to think about the idea of causation? And here's where the old philosophers come in again. Because the answer is yes, there's another sense of cause which doesn't assume everything has to be based on antecedent forces an older sense originally formulated by Aristotle. And that is that a cause is an explanation for how something happens, for what gives rise to it. So it's a bigger picture idea than a cause is the antecedent force that gave rise to something, right? The mechanical view that a cause is the antecedent force was made famous by the Enlightenment philosopher David Hume. And it says that all explanations of cause have to be explanations of actions that happened previous to the event. Like a car spins around on the street because a truck hit it, or CO2 from my breath collides with elements in the air to form water, or a baby was born because a sperm united with an egg in a womb. But if you think about it, for example, with the example of the egg and the sperm, is the latter the cause of the baby? Or could we look farther back and say a man and a woman search for life partners because they thought that they would make them happy and fulfilled. And having found each other, they made love because they wanted to conceive a child and the man's sperm united with the woman's egg. So you can see this is a broader view of cause. It doesn't reduce cause merely to an antecedent physical action. And here, the bigger picture of this is you have to apply the principle of necessary and sufficient to causes. And what I mean by this is understanding the physical and the chemical 
principles operating in the union of a sperm and an egg is necessary to understanding how babies are born, but it's not sufficient. We need to understand the wider context of human thoughts, motives, abilities, and choices in order to explain why the sperm and the egg got together and the baby came to be. We need to understand the entire system of human life the biological, the psychological, the social, the emotional, if we really want to understand how the baby came to be born. Now, you know what the determinist will say is, well, we'll just have to explain all those aspects of the system in deterministic form, and that's what they keep trying to do. But if you think about it, this means that all action is not just caused by previous action, like billiard balls hitting each other. Some actions originate within a system. For example, to understand the orbits of the planets, you have to see that they're in this system of relationship to each other. You can't just look at the individual planets. You can't understand their orbits if you just look at the individual planet. You have to see it in relationship to the other planets. And this is true of living things. You can't understand living things unless you see them as a system. And that one of the things that living things can do is they can originate action within themselves. It's one of the main characteristics of living things is its ability, their ability to maintain their life. And they do that by internal organization. They get food, they respire, they reproduce. There's this origination within themselves to do these actions to maintain their own existence. If you look at a, a cell, the cell itself is a kind of whole in the sense that if you put it in the right physical environment, like in a Petri dish, it can stay alive outside of the body. But you can't really understand why a cell is taking an iron, for example, when it's in the body, unless you see that it functions as part of the whole body system and what the body needs. And that if it's a red blood cell, it operates as part of the circulatory system and is bringing oxygen to various parts of the body. So then you can see that the human body is like a, a complete system of interacting subparts, cells, tissues, organs, and consciousness. And these are all parts of this whole system of living things. And the consciousness has these subparts of ideas, emotions, and motives, right? So the system works together and it makes possible the living human being. And to understand a human being, you have to look at this bigger picture to understand why human beings do a lot of things, like why the baby ended up being born. Well, with this broader view of cause, you can recognize that some causes arise from within the organization of a being and the powers that arise from that organization. And one of the powers is self-initiated action, that the organization of living things gives it the power for self-initiated action. So the action is caused by the powers within the, human, the being. And this is true of living beings in general, but one of the things that distinguishes living from non-living is this ability to start action, to wake up from sleep and move towards food, for example, or to kick something. And in biology, I guess in systems theory generally, this is now thought of as an emergent property, something that arises out of the new arrangement of things. So if you think about it, Humans, in an evolutionary sense, we have a new biological arrangement, obviously, because we have a different kind of body and brain than other animals, and this has given us these new abilities, this ability to think in concepts, to think abstractly, to speak, and this is why we have to have this new concept of mind to explain those things. Along with this new abilities came this ability to control what you're paying attention to. And controlling what you pay attention to controls what you do and how you act. And that's what free will is, the self-initiated ability to control what you pay attention to and what you think about. Let me make sure I have this right. <laughs> so free will is this emergent property that has risen out of this new arrangement of things or out of human evolution, like from our brains came this concept of mind. And this property allows us to become a cause of new action. And this is different from the other view of causation where everything is reduced to a previous physical action, kind of like the billiard balls you mentioned, which leads to this deterministic thinking, which doesn't really leave any room for free will. Exactly. And you know, the really ironic thing about the billiard ball example is it's human beings hitting the billiard balls. <laughs> That's true. 
But how does this idea of free will as an emergent property relate to our concept of the self then? Well, it's because human beings are able to self-reflect because of this, this new property of paying attention. So they can pay attention to what's going on inside their own mind. And because of that, they can direct their actions. Because they can control what you're thinking about, they can control how they act. So each person has this self-directing ability, and it's, it's a part of you that can initiate action and causes what you, you'll do and what you decide to learn, what to practice, how to act in order to live. But it's your whole self. It's your entire being that does this. It's not just your brain or some small part of you. Some of the proof that our conscious self doesn't control ourselves are experiments that show this evidence that our subconscious brain starts taking actions well before we're consciously aware of making the decision to take an action. Just to be clear about this, the word consciousness itself can be used equivocally, in other words, with two different meanings. One of the meanings is that Consciousness is awareness per se, like sensation and perception, what all sentient animals have. But another use of it is being aware that you are aware and you are aware of your mental and physical processes. In other words, the word consciousness can be used to mean self-awareness. I personally like to say self-conscious awareness and then conscious awareness to try to distinguish these two. But people use these experiments I'm talking about as if we are not deciding because they say if choices really are being made several seconds ahead of awareness, there's not much space for free will to operate. And this is a a neuroscience researcher named John Dylan Haynes. But that equates the self only with self-conscious awareness and self-conscious decision making. So it's saying that if self is the self-conscious part, and there's some part of your brain that's doing something and making the decision before you're aware of it, then that means you are not really controlling it. But in this other view that I'm talking about, this entire system view, that the self is our entire being, then this paradox disappears because consciousness is the complete interaction of what's in focal awareness In other words, what we're paying attention to and can be self-consciously aware of and what's held in the subconscious store of our information, ideas, and processes going on. So our self is our whole self. And there's plenty of evidence that this is the case. If you look at the research of Antonio Damasio, for example, you'll find out that people who've lost part of the brain that connects their self-conscious part, which is in like your frontal lobe, with your emotions, they can't live well. They can't make choices. They, they can't follow through on actions that are, that are actually going to keep them alive. And that's because their self that's making the decisions is not just that self-conscious part of the brain, but it's the whole system. And, and this isn't to n- deny that biology and social experience aren't important and powerful in shaping who we are. It's denying that they determine everything we are, that we can't shape what we do with our biology and with our social experiences, Right. Some determinists will bring up experiments that show how smells of which you're not aware, can consciously aware, can influence what you like or what you don't like. They can influence how you act, you know, even though you're not consciously aware of it. But the thing is that the smells influence are, tend to be only transitory and contextual. Even though if you were in a situation where you had to make a choice in that instance, it might be important and positively affect you. But the fact is, that that's about influencing our likes and our dislikes, not about forcing me to think something. And it's especially not any thought or conclusion that I've had time to reflect on. You know, you can't reach into my brain and turn a switch and make me think something. You can influence me, but you can't actually make me think something. And it's not that it's easy to be in control of what you feel and you do. Heck, that's why we're here talking about ideas that can influence you without your even being consciously aware, right? But the more I'm self-aware, the less these outside influences can affect me. I'm more conscious of what's going on inside of me, and I can choose what to do about these influences. It's kind of like advertising tricks. Once you're aware of them, you can better decide objectively about whether you're interested in the product or you're not. 
So your self-aware choices, the specific things you end up doing, are the ways in which your self is embodied. You become a musician, you take up skydiving, you work to educate poor children. What surprises me is that someone like the famous atheist writer Sam Harris believes in a non-self. Why? Why does that surprise me? Because Harris seems to me to, to have a very strongly directed self. Sure, he's not the same from decade to decade. That's one of his arguments. But he is the same in that he likes to change direction from decade to decade, right? And if you look at him, he's created a remarkable and an original career for himself. He's bucked the status quo. He takes unusual positions. In other words, he embodies a strong will. So in that way, he kind of contradicts his anti-free will position. He seems to me to have a robust core directing principle and ability because he's very active, he's ambitious, he's thinking about things, and he chooses what he's thinking and doing. Yeah, I like what you said about making self-aware choices and how that's kind of an embodiment of this free will because I'm thinking about things that I'm unconsciously aware of, like, you know, when I'm not feeling well, maybe I'll emotionally eat and I'll just keep eating chocolate. But if I then become aware of this habit that I have, I can then know like, okay, right now I really want a piece of chocolate because I'm having a bad day, but I'm not going to have it. I'm just going to try to see if it goes away. And then slowly you can overcome those habits and you become in control of something. Whereas before you were under control of you know, your unconscious drives or like this advertising around you that tells you chocolate makes you happy. And I like what you said also about you. it's not easy to be in control of what you feel and do. And that made me think of what Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset said. And here's a quote from him. He wrote, We all realize to some extent that the kind of life to which we are committed is already determined in areas deeper than those in which our will is active. Turning experiences and arguments over and over in our minds is futile. Our hearts with the obstinacy of a star are committed to a predetermined orbit, which will revolve by its own gravitation toward art, political ambition, sexual pleasure, or money. Many times, the surface existence of an individual rubs against the grain of his inner destiny, and surprising disguises are the result of this friction. The businessman who conceals a sensualist or the writer whose only real ambition is political power. What I get from this is that there are parts of us that are set, and it's futile to think our way to change for some things, like our interests or our tastes. These parts of our personality that are obstinate or that despite certain types of experiences and living, you can't really change, kind of like being gay in a culture that condemns homosexuality. These things are deeper than just our will to change, which almost seems like an argument against free will. But then what you're saying is that when you become more self-aware, this helps us gauge what we are in control of and what's beyond our control. Sure. I mean, like the fact that I'm never going to be taller than 5'4". There might be parts of my psyche that aren't malleable either, right? So part of our work to take control of ourselves is to figure out what's in our control and what to accept and then work with that. I think that's the kind of thing Ortega is getting at. Yeah, well, when you put it that way, I just think about all the time I spent in my youth trying to change things about myself that I couldn't change and how much agony and suffering that causes. You know, like, I want to be tall and thin. I want to have fun going to parties. You know, but every time I went, you know, I would have a terrible time being around so many people. Or, you know, I wanted to be interested in finance or medicine because then I could study those and get a high paying job, but I was just not interested in those things. And just struggling to make those things happen, like if I had studied something that I like really hated, but was like, maybe I'll get a good job, you know, that's so much time and energy wasted. And not to mention just like makes you feel totally inadequate and that acceptance of those things that you can't change, I think is a difficult thing to do because you want to be able to control everything about yourself. But, you know, I'll never be taller than 5'1", you know, and that's, that I cannot change. But when you do start changing those things you are in control of, then you get like a really big sense of accomplishment. It's like I can't change my height and I can't really change my body proportions, but I can get fit and I can gain muscle and lose some fat. 
and like you can overcome your shyness or putting yourself out there and gaining confidence, but you could still prefer small groups of people over large groups of and parties. So discovering what you are in control of and what your true interests are and what you can do can make life so much more enjoyable. And I think that's in part that exercising of free will that you're talking about. Yes, although we know it's really tricky to figure out who we are and what's our authentic self. But there are some ways that help. Yeah, I like the way Ortega y Gasset also describes the self in relation to love. He uses phrases like the self is our ultimate personality or, you know, our true nature, essential nature, or a very utterly personal core or inner character, innermost being. And he says like all of that stems from our metaphysical sentiment or our attitude toward all of reality, like what life holds for us. And this kind of reminded me of what Ayn Rand called our sense of life. And so this comes from the most profound depths of our being. And it's not just our self-consciousness, which is only a part of our being, kind of like what you said with those experiments that, well, yeah, sure, that's only one aspect of consciousness, but that doesn't explain it all. But it's not exactly clear how much of this is influenced by our biology or our social environment and from our self-consciousness, which might be like our will or our own doing. You know, what you just talked about and what Ortega was saying, it reminds me of uh, Nietzsche's idea of will to power. And I, I think Ortega, from what I know, was influenced by Nietzsche, so it's not surprising, you know. But Nietzsche's idea relates to, I think in some respects, or could be thought of as the vitality of a person. You know, the, the life force and the particular ways it manifests itself. And I don't mean life force in a mystical sense. I mean as a core aspect of biological existence, that you, you have this energy towards staying alive and towards finding those things that you need to. We're living beings, you know, and each person, they're born with their own na individual nature and, it's, and their own plan for growth, just like a plant, the biological causes of the person. But how that plan is implemented depends on our physical, social, intellectual, and emotional environment. And that includes the kind of the environment that we create by our self-awareness and our choices. And it's, it's, it's obvious with things like physical characteristics. For example, older Japanese immigrants to the U.S. tend to be very short, but they have kids who become quite tall because of the enriched protein diet here. And the same thing, I think, happens with mental abilities depending on the environment. And this is pretty obvious because that's why people are concerned about giving disadvantaged kids a richer environment because they say, okay, you know, the, the privileged kids have a, a great environment already. We have to make it equal to the disadvantaged kids. The thing is, if you have an environment that's rich with the kind of things that we know humans need for excellent growth, then the, the elements to explore and to help develop people's individual capacities and fulfill their needs help the child flourish, right? When I think about this view, though, that I'm just talking about, that we, we're living beings and we start with a certain kind of nature and we need a, a good environment to flourish, this is an organic view of the self. It's not a deterministic view of the self. I mean, some people might see it as deterministic because they say, oh, well, whether the child is put into a rich environment or not determines how they develop. What I mean is that what we become flows from our material self and our social setting, but it's not determined from that in the sense that it couldn't be otherwise, exactly. Because, you, you know, there's always people who are born into very rich environments, and yet they become drunkards. Uh, they become playboys. They are unhappy. They, they maybe even become criminals. So there's something else that operates there, and that has to do with how they interact with their social and biological environment and what ch choices they make. Sometimes, and I think this is what you're getting at with the Ortega quotes, sometimes the willing part of us can try to override the deepest biological part and its needs, and then we have a problem. Like you gave the example, you know, somebody who is gay and yet they're trying to force themselves to be heterosexual, then they 
end up having tremendous problems, anxiety, depression, suicide, you know, things like that. Or there can be a social influence that's so strong that tries to override the deep biological characteristic, like a woman who's very strongly attracted to men, but she lives in an extremely conservative society and she has to accept those standards of that society and she ha can have a tremendous inner conflict about it. And it's interesting, this can manifest itself in illnesses and lack of energy or even psychosis because she has to, she has to repress her sexual feelings all the time. She has to stop herself from looking at men who are attractive and she can't talk to them or be close to them or allow herself to get aroused, and she feels horribly guilty. Consequently, this ends up making her feel very agitated and frustrated. And I'm not just making this up, but in the 19th century, it was a staple of 19th century Victorian society, this kind of problem for women, this repression. Many unmarried women were thought to become hysterical because of what they called retention of female semen that poisoned the blood. They had this whole theory about it. So really what it was about was that women were sexually frustrated. So what happened was women would go to doctors to be masturbated by early vibrators. And, um, <laughs> uh, but it was considered, a, it was considered a, a medical procedure. But it just shows you what happens when you try to repress, uh, because of social reasons, try to repress some of your deepest inner needs. Yeah, and... That example is kind of funny, but then you can also see how true it is because if you're experiencing these things, but society is telling you that it's wrong or it's bad, then you feel guilty. And like, what does that do to your self-esteem or your self-image? That's something you feel like you can't change. And then you try to repress and you don't act on it. Oh, that just sounds so horrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I think that example shows that there is some kind of conflict between these biological and social influences. And that it seems like we have the ability to overcome that conflict by choosing an alternative or that we suffer from it by not acting. And so it seems like we do have some kind of choice. So when there is this conflict, what allows us to act seems to be something separate from our biology and social influences. And so when we say the self, I think what we're talking about is something that encompasses more than the ego or the conscious mind or our biology or society. It's kind of like all of them together. Right, exactly. And not just one thing. Yeah, it's, an, it's, it's, it's the person's whole being. Because we're not just this little man in our heads. We're a living being and our consciousness is a superb tool for living if we learn how to use it. And it's true that we're limited in some respects by our physical self. And it's true that our brains must be different. And, you know, some people uh, have better memory processing. Some people have better emotional control. And this affects our minds. And it's true that our upbringing and our experiences and the society we live in, that they shape and influence everything, our ideas and values and our actions and our habits. And it's true that things like improved nutrition affects the height of certain people over time. On the other hand, there have always been people who've chosen to live outside their social designation and who challenge their natural limits, right? But these people usually had a, a willingness and ability to, to withstand disapproval of others because um, shunning was so typical and uh, the social pressure of not following what other people want you to think and do is very strong. And I'm not merely talking about getting some outrageous tattoos. What I'm talking about are people who, whose meritable actions gain them achievements and they gain them respect. And it seems to me like these thinkers and these inventors and these people of character, these are the people, their discoveries and their actions, they change the course of history. You know, I'm thinking of people like George Washington, who everybody called the indispensable man. You know, he wasn't the most educated of the founders. He wasn't the smartest, but he had a towering character and force of character. And, you know, he worked on his character constantly. He, he had a very bad temper, and he was constantly working on controlling it. And he had books of principles that he used to help him remind himself how he should act. Or what about other examples like Joan of Arc, who was a 15-year-old woman who led the French army? or Galileo who defied the Catholic Church 
for science. Or Frederick Douglass, who was the first African-American abolitionist and a former slave. Or Amelia Earhart, who was the first woman to fly transatlantic, transatlantic and um, she tried to fly around the world. It's funny because this idea that you can control your destiny, that you had ability to change what you were, it was very strong in the 19th century, and you can see it in um, the popular novels of that time. They celebrated the spirit. They featured individuals who figured out ways to achieve their goals despite social and physical limitations, like the Horatio Alger novels, or um, there's many others. Horatio Alger is famous for the young men so-called bringing themselves up by their own bootstraps, you know, improving themselves. And what's funny is nowadays in the field that's called positive psychology, or the good ways that people live, there's lots of experimental work lately about how we can go a lot farther than we thought and how, how we do it. You know, work like, and there's a book called Peak, about how you get peak performance, and the work on flow, and the work on mindset, how you can change the way you think and it changes the way you act. So even though there's experimental work supposedly showing that we're determined, there's this other experimental work showing that we can actually change the way we are. Yeah, I think this is kind of helping me think about this concept of the self because we have these limitations or these social pressures that do somewhat shape our pressure, but then there is this part of us that seems to go beyond those things, like all those examples, like Joan of Arc or Frederick Douglass or Galileo, like they were able to overcome all of those things. So I'm trying to get a better idea of the concept of the self because it does seem like we have all these influences, but then there is this other part. And it reminds me of what um, psychologist and author Brian Little explains as conflicting claims to what is our authentic self and he kind of goes through the same thing like there's this biological claim we have a biological nature and we can be true to this first nature and then there's our sociogenic or environmental claims on ourself like you know sociological influences that encourage or discourage certain behavior but then there seems to be this other thing like these idiosyncratic things that arise from ourselves that are like unique to us this reminds me when you mentioned how we can direct our attention and that directs our actions because if we know that our biological makeup and society have these claims on who we are like a biological predisposition for disease or sexual desire and like society which like can encourage brutality towards certain type groups of people. Like we can choose to focus our attention on those things or we can choose to focus our attention on other values or goals that we have. And this focus will help guide us toward those things even if they're in conflict with those other biological or social claims. And what Brian Little says is that that is the real you. That's the one you can control is basically this focus that you explained. And I'm thinking that, that if you don't really have clearly defined values and you don't really know it's influencing you, you know, then it's really difficult to know then how to act or what to do. And so then you might passively default to what you think is in your nature. Like, oh, people just, you know, have a biological need to procreate, so I'm just going to cheat on my spouse. Or you think you have to do something because of your culture. So like, I'm just going to ostracize homosexuals or I'm just going to be heterosexual. And if you do define your values, then you can overcome those things. But if you don't have something that's guiding you, then it's really hard to know what to do. And then it's very easy to fall back onto those things. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think that the, he's emphasizing the importance of knowing what set of principles you believe in and what's consciously or unconsciously affecting you. What principles are you implementing without either knowing or not knowing? So it seems like another thing to investigate for each person is if you've got limits, how do you discover them and how do you work with them, right? And there's interesting research on that. I think I mentioned that earlier, especially by this guy named Anders Ericsson. He wrote a book called Peak. And he looked into 
elite athletes and all kinds of other people, fighter pilots, people who really push the limits of what they're able to do. And it turns out that the exact limits are not known almost on anything. He had a great example, and that was um, there's a lot of competition in memory. In other words, people competing on how many digits they can remember. And in the 70s, the guy who won all of the competitions could remember 500 digits. But now the guys who win the competitions remember thousands and thousands of digits. And it's not because anybody's brain is bigger or better or anything like that now. It's because they learn all kinds of strategies for how to improve their memory and remember more and more numbers. And this is true on so many other things, too. The same is true of um, marathon running. Oh, gosh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I know that the guy who won one of the marathons early, early on, like around the turn of the century the first at the first Olympics in modern times, ran at a speed that would barely qualify him for the for the Olympics now. So it's, it's pretty amazing. But what all of these things revolve around, learning your limits, is a heightened sense of self-awareness and a sense of purpose and practice and perseverance. I think we could sum it all up with another Ortega quote. He says, we live at a time when man believes himself fabulously capable of creation, but he does not know what to create. Lord of all things, he is not Lord of himself. And I think what Ortega is saying there is, we seem to have a lot of control over everything in the world, but we don't have control over our inner self. So let's start being lords of ourselves. So one of the ways we can do that, of course, is by increasing our ability to introspect. And we're going to, and we're going to go into that and investigate how we can do that better in a future podcast. If you like this podcast, you can support us by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or even Yelp. And you can tell your friends about it. You can mention it on Facebook or other social media. And you can support it by contributions at our website, thegreatconnections.org. Thanks for listening, and please join us next time.